Hey, this is Sule Morvina, and tune in to The Relay for the latest news in boxing all around the world. Thank you for supporting myself and other female boxers. We truly appreciate it. Welcome to the motherfucking Relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, and now it's time for our weekend recap. We're going to be talking about the second installment of the Fight Camp series that none other than Ebony Bridges kicked off with her fight against Beck Connolly. This was Ebony's attempt to rebound off the loss to Shannon Courtney in what was their WBA title fight not that long ago, and Ebony Bridges did not disappoint. She lived up to my expectations against the always game, though not so always durable, Beck Connolly. And it was one-way traffic from the start. Very early in the match, Ebony Bridges established the lead hand, the left hand. Very early in the fight, you saw her establish the double jab to not only get within striking distance of the more statuesque Beck Connolly. Yeah, Beck is taller than Ebony. You know, I like the double jab from Ebony Bridges. Some mention was made of Ebony pushing with the shot as opposed to snapping out that jab. I think the discrepancy in height might have had something to do with that. Because Beck is taller. basic idea there is to double up on the jab to get within striking distance of the opponent and simultaneously keep their guns holstered. Because they're either covering up or they're getting hit. And in the case of Beck Connolly, she was getting hit. She wasn't keeping that head of hers off the line, the imaginary center line. Yeah, she ate a lot of jabs. And there was some mention of Ebony pushing with those jabs as opposed to snapping them out there. I think the discrepancy in height between the combatants might have had something to do with that, that even though Ebony Bridges is effectively getting off those double jabs because she's the shorter fighter. She's pushing them to make contact. At least I suspect that because Ebony's the shorter fighter with the shorter arms, she might have been pushing with that jab in an effort to make contact with Beck. Just touch her with it. To set up bigger shots, overhand rights upstairs and sneaky body work downstairs. And we did see that from Ebony Bridges whenever she did manage to close the gap. Sneaky body shots to Beck Connolly's midsection, taking the air out of the tires before the car even gets going. It was one-way traffic. One-way traffic throughout from the first round to the subsequent third round. When the fight was stopped by the referee, that was after Ebony Bridges managed to score a knockdown. Beck Connolly in an exchange. And Beck didn't really recover from that. She didn't. She picks herself up, dusts herself off, but she doesn't have all her wits about her, all of her faculties. Ebony, she gets off another hard shot. Referee Kieran McCann decided that Lady Luck, Beck Connolly, she'd had enough. This stoppage did get mixed reviews. It was convincing to some, unconvincing to others. In truth, I wish that Kieran would have allowed the fight to go on, not necessarily because it was a bad stoppage, but so that Ebony Bridges can finish the job and finish the job clean. Leave no doubt. Don't get me wrong, it did seem like a mercy stoppage from where I was sitting, from where I was sitting. It didn't look like Beck fully recovered from that initial knockdown, but to some, it was messy and unconvincing. It lived up to my expectations, I've been saying it for at least a year now that Ebony Bridges, she packs a wallop. This is a fighter that can really punch. It's one of her standout qualities, that and her close quarters fighting. But I saw some gripes after the fight was stopped. More and more in this postmodern era of boxing, the boxing fans and the boxing critics alike are particularly hard to please when it comes to referee stoppages. What might seem like a mercy stoppage to one might seem like the referee was doing Ebony Bridges a favor to some. Myself, I wasn't particularly displeased with the stoppage because it was one-way traffic throughout. It was only a matter of time from where I was sitting. Beck was getting hit a lot. She looked ready to go to me and and eventually, she did as Ebony Bridges advances to a professional record of six wins, one loss with three knockouts. Kick off the second installment of Fight Camp. Season two, and I have to say that this installment of Fight Camp was a little bit more enjoyable than the last one. I want to say that... I enjoyed the Johnny Fisher fight. The Romford Bull advanced to a professional record of three wins, three knockouts with no losses against Danny Whitaker. I enjoyed the Fabio Wardley versus Nick Webb fight. I will admit that that fight ended a lot more abruptly than I expected. I did go with Fabio Wardley to win, and I did go with Fabio to win by knockout, but I thought it would happen much later in the fight. As Fabio Wardley... He's not an artillery guy. I mean, don't get me wrong, the guy can punch at least at this level, but his characteristics as a fighter are more in keeping with that of a slickster. Guy who tries to be more of a technician, looking for openings or setting up shots. Fabio Wardley, guy who likes to roll punches off the shoulder. He's not a mauler. And because of that, I didn't expect this fight to end as abruptly as it did. I didn't expect this fight to end in the first round. And what I think happened here is Nick Webb, he actually got off to a very fast start. He wanted to assert himself early 
and looks a lot like he forced Fabio to respond in kind. He forced him to fight back. Forced Fabio to fight him off. Forced Fabio to let his hands go. And when he did... Well, you saw what happened. And you know, ahead of this fight, I wasn't convinced that Nick Webb takes the best punch. I know that punch resistance in the heavyweight division, having a chin and not having a chin, it's a very contentious subject at this weight because at this weight, you're always one punch away from being put on your back pocket. You're always one punch away from being put on the canvas in the heavyweight division. So it's hard to gauge who actually has punch resistance. And who doesn't? In the heavyweight division, yes, yeah, sometimes it is because any one of these guys has the punching power to take out any one of these guys. Is it fair to call anyone chinny at heavyweight? I know that the grim specter of David Price being floored two times by Tony Thompson in their two fights must be passing through all of your minds right now. And yes, I think it's safe to say that David Price is chinny. And I had a very similar sentiment in reference to Nick Webb, who was stopped by Dave Allen. Dave, who's a durable guy, no doubt about it, but he's not exactly the biggest puncher, and he managed... Yeah, he managed to stop Nick Webb. I thought to myself that, you know, if Dave Allen can... Get a knockout like that. I think Fabio Wardley can at least match it. I think Fabio Wardley has enough that he can perhaps knock out Nick Webb as well. And and that's what he did much sooner than I expected. Congratulations to him. And I have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed the card. More than I expected to, if I'm being honest. In today's postmodern era of boxing snobs, purists, and tough critics that are hard to please. It was very entertaining. With several elements at work. That made it very easy to digest, even for the seasoned fight fan. I mean, you. You see, there weren't that many familiar faces or big names on this card. So you don't approach it with the expectations you might have for another. You could take this at face value. Take it for what it is and enjoy it because most of the fighters that fought on this card ain't being tabbed as world beaters. Johnny Fisher. Fabio Wardley. These are guys that are in the beginning stages of their careers. It's far too soon to make any proclamations about what they're going to do. It's enjoyable just watching them progress. Alan Babic and the slobber knocker that he had with Mark Bennett. The very stubborn Mark Bennett. Who Alan Babic managed to stop in five rounds. Yeah, after hitting him with everything but the kitchen sink. You know, Mark Bennett. He weighed in at about 272 pounds to Alan Babic, who weighed in at about 210 pounds. It's safe to say that Alan Babic is on the smaller, much smaller end of the spectrum as far as heavyweights go. Head of this fight, he's dealing with a guy who's got a 62-pound weight advantage. He's a bigger guy. A much beefier guy and a taller guy. And even though Alan Babic, in very entertaining fashion, I might add, managed to secure the W, there's a reason you heard so many mentions of the Bridger weight division. Bridger weight. Yeah, they keep bringing that up for no reason. The pace at which Alan Bobich likes to fight a fight is a mile a minute. This guy can really go. But in the heavyweight division, in the land of the Giants, brute force, brute force in and of itself, can only get you so far. Even for Alan Bobich. Who's a lot of fucking fun. And he really is. At this level, he can keep beating the brakes off of guys like... Mark Bennett and... Shondell Winters. Damian Chambers, those kinds of guys. Because with those kinds of guys, brute force, well, that might be all you need. There's not a lot to break down about this fight. There aren't very many subtleties to decipher when it comes to Alan Bobich and how he goes about fighting a fight. There really aren't. And it's for that reason that I think... He's probably going to move down. And that's probably what's best for him. He has shown that at a certain level, a very low level, he can bang with the big boys so long as the big boys are as big and limited as a Mark Bennett, guy who's far from a world-class heavyweight. Alan Bobich has shown us that much, but he steps up in competition with some of these top-tier, top-shelf heavyweights that are out there. I'm just giving it to you straight. Wouldn't hurt Alan Bobich one bit to cut that 10 pounds and move down to cruiser. The cruiserweight division in recent years has been garnering more and more attention than it used to in previous eras of boxing. The cruiserweight division was often referred to as the forgotten division, the heavyweight division's less attractive younger sister. I think Alan Bobbitt should go there. The cruiserweight division and the bridgeweight division are divisions that Alan Bobbitt, given his physical dimensions, is more adequately suited to campaign in. And because he's still making his bones as a professional boxer, still amassing professional experience, for the time being, 
he might make more of a splash there than he will moving forward as a heavyweight. Because as he moves forward as a heavyweight, you're going to face more talented guys than Mark Bennett, believe you me. He beat that fucking guy like a drum. At a feverish pace, I might add. But that, that in and of itself is only going to get you so far when you're Alan Bobich because you're not the biggest guy and you ain't got the biggest punch. And it's not like you're disguising your punches or anything. The way you can hit a guy with a punch that he doesn't see because it's those punches that the other guy doesn't see. It's those punches that the other guy doesn't see and he doesn't brace himself for. Those are the knockout shots. I mean, at this level, you can plow through guys. At this level, you can just coming forward and going hell for leather but at some point more is needed more is going to be required and and alan babich he just ain't that guy not right now i think a move downstairs would benefit him greatly because alan babich is making a name for himself he's garnering more and more fans fight by fight more so than his decorated amateur countryman philippe hergovic who has lost considerable momentum it's the weirdest thing with these two guys these two croatian sensations alan babic is garnering more attention fight by fight than philippe hergovic yet it's philippe hergovic who exhibits the higher ceiling and and more potential to really make a splash as a heavyweight that if you've been watching both of these guys you might be telling yourself you know philippe hergovic stands a legitimate chance of becoming a world-class heavyweight at least more than Alain, but it's Alain that's got all the buzz. It's Alain that has all the momentum. And if he wants to continue to build on that, well, maybe he should move downstairs where he's more adequately suited to mall guys the way that he likes the mall guys. I thoroughly enjoyed watching Alain Babic beat the fucking brakes off of Mark Bennett. And it was rather heartwarming and endearing to see Alan Babich propose to his now fiance after the fight, after he secured the W. All that stuff is great. I fucking love the guy. As entertained as I was by this uh, shellacking that he put on Mark Bennett, for me, what it accented is that Alan Babich just ain't quite cut out for this division. And this is only gonna get him so far. He needs to move down. He could really be something. Finally, we come to the main event of that same card, the sequel to Jazza Dickens versus Kid Galahad. This time it was for the IBF world title in the featherweight division. Uh, I, I decided to go with Kid Galahad to win. And, and what we got from Kid Galahad, who's really coming into his own. It was an excellent display of boxing. After the first two rounds. I had it a tight score with the first round going to Jazz Dickens, who seemed like the busier man, landing the cleaner punches. Second round, I decided to give to Kid Galahad, who put on display his very effective switch hitting, fighting out of both the orthodox and southpaw stances throughout the course of that round. Uh, he did this several times throughout the fight, the entirety of the fight. Seamless switch hitting. And it was after those first two rounds, from round three onward, that Kid Galahad really separated himself from Jazz Dickens, who would occasionally get through with a hard hard shot, pockets of success, but nothing consistent. No, he's never as consistent as Kid Galahad's jab. Which had a major role in this fight's aesthetic and how it all played out. What the docks the southpaw. The lead hand of Kid Galahad really was the star of the show. And this was one of those fights that's a testament to just how important consistent usage of the lead hand is and how it can affect a fight's aesthetic and a fighter. And there's a lot of different ways to use that lead hand. There really are a lot of different ways to shoot a jab. Many variations of it. Stiff jabs and step jabs that you step into. Flip jabs that are intended to service as decoys and diversions, distractions to set up other shots. Kid Galahad's jab just flowed. It wasn't at all tense and it didn't seem like there was very much being put on it at first. Not very many bad intentions on the lead hand from Kid Galahad, but it was the consistency of the lead hand from either stance. Yeah, he was really switched on. Seamlessly transitioning from orthodox to southpaw back to orthodox, all the while employing the lead hand, never abandoning it. And I had Kid Galahad separating himself from Jazza Dickens after four rounds. After four rounds, I had it three rounds to Kid Galahad, one round to Jazz Dickens that first round, that opening round. The body work from Kid Galahad shouldn't go unnoticed. There was a conscious effort 
a conscious and consistent effort to go to Jazz Dickens' body, slow him down. When he wasn't painting Jazz Dickens' face with jab, he's taking the air out of the tires by consistently targeting his body, targeting his midsection. At the end of six rounds, I had it five rounds to one. Favor of Kid Galahad. Really separated himself from Jazz Dickens. I did have Jazz Dickens picking up the seventh round. He seemed a little bit busier than Kid Galahad. Landed some real good clean shots that you didn't have to look for. Had Jazza Dickens picking up the seventh and Kid Galahad picking up the subsequent eighth by getting back on that jab and controlling the distance. He was poised, he was poised the, whole the whole time. time. Very composed, very controlled as he battered Jazza Dickens. By this time, Kid Galahad had accumulated considerable damage to Jazza Dickens' face, busting up his nose, He's painting the town red. He's doing it by jabbing and moving. Shifting and minding his distance. I had Kit Galahad picking up the ninth round. At this point, it was painfully obvious that Jazza Dickens needed something dramatic to happen because this fight, it, it really got away from him. Yeah, I had Kit Galahad picking up the ninth. And the, uh, in the tenth, referee Michael Alexander decided to deduct the point from Kid Galahad because, you know... He was stepping on Jazza Dickens' foot. And the thing is, Jazza Dickens being a southpaw and the, uh, Kid Galahad being an orthodox switch hitter, guy that goes back and forth from orthodox to southpaw, this is gonna happen. When Galahad's fighting out of the orthodox stance, it is. We've seen it a million times in a million other fights when orthodox fighters are in there with southpaws. Their feet cross. Yeah, you know, sometimes one guy's lead foot ends up stepping on another guy's lead foot. I don't really know if that was on purpose. It seemed to me like... Referee Michael Alexander was on Kid Galahad's case all night, looking for any reason to give him a hard time. With that point deduction in the 10th, I had Jazza Dickens picking up his third round of the match. But by this time, Kid Galahad had already amassed a substantial lead on my card. Too little, too late for the Liverpool man. The jabber from Sheffield moved on from that 10th to pick up the 11th on my card. Fight got waved off after the 11th. I want to say that... It's not that Jazza Dickens didn't give it a go. He did, but the work from Kid Galahad was just a lot cleaner. And he maintained his composure throughout. He never got greedy. He stuck to what worked. Stayed on his jab. Minded his distance. Targeted the body whenever it was available. Taking the air out of the tires as to tire Jazza Dickens before he can even get anything going. And I don't want to understate the role of the body work. The jab really was the star of the show for Kid Galahad, but the body work had its role to play. Well, because you can take the fight right out of a guy if you consistently go there. That's what Kid Galahad did. A pivot here, a shift there, stay on your jab, target the midsection whenever it's possible. It was fluid. It was... It was an excellent display of boxing is what it was. And a hard fight to score is what it wasn't. As I reiterate, Kid Galahad really separated himself from Jazza Dickens after three. Never losing his composure, even after he'd get hit with a clean shot, he maintained his cool, maintained his consistency. Didn't even have to hit another gear with Jazz Dickens. He stuck to what worked. That's why he is the newly crowned IBF champion. Closing thoughts, it was just an excellent display of boxing in what was a very entertaining card. Congratulations to the newly crowned champion.